Welcome to the Date Forever podcast. Keep your relationship fueled up with strategies discovered by couples and experts. Because at Fuel Collective, we believe better relationships will equal a better world. You are about to discover specific insights and tools that cost little or nothing to implement to help you date forever. And now, here are your hosts, a couple who always have a half-packed suitcase and a date night in the calendar, Sammy and Nathan Yeager. Hello, and welcome to Date Forever. In this week's episode, we're chatting about lessons that you can learn from divorce and why you might want to avoid it. Is the grass always green on the other side of a breakup or divorce? Agreeing to disagree as a method of conflict resolution and understanding if opposites attract and learning how to love your differences. But before we get into that, Sammy, what's been fueling you up this week? Oh my gosh, we had the fueliest up this week. <laughs> if that's a technical term. Yeah. For, yeah. yeah, yeah. We added a huge amount of fuel this past week. To- yeah, we did, didn't we? Yeah, we attended Unleash the Power Within with Tony Robbins for four days at home, remote, (laughs) jumping around our living living room room and study, learning about our beliefs and our values and what's important to us. Yeah, Uh, some of the things that are holding us back and and how we can shift some of those things. Yeah, we talked everything. We talked about, yeah, our career and business, our relationship with ourselves, our romantic relationship. Mm. The future, our, our, our impact on the world. Our health and well-being. Yeah, yeah. everything. Yeah. Um, this is our third time attending this event. We attended for the first time in 2019, the last uh, real-life in-person UPW <laughs> that I think Tony did, and we walked on fire. We did, yeah. And on the day, we bought tickets to the following year's event because we, we knew that there was so much goal in that one event that I felt like we'd missed some, so it was like, we need to go again. It was like a really mm. great movie that you're like, I just need to see it again. Yeah, and then we've, now it's just become part of our life. Yeah, and I think that's one of the good lessons to learn about mastering something or, or learning something is that you can hear it once and just kind of hear it and not necessarily do anything about it, but you know it cognitively that it's something that is good to be doing or, or that could benefit you, but I guess once you actually start surrounding yourself with some of these things and and some new lessons and you hear it for a second or third time, it becomes like commonplace in your mind and it becomes something that you just believe is being true and that you know is true and that you actually start implementing even if it's subconsciously. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely feel like um, UPW is like a pillar in our year now where it's like, yeah, you wouldn't just go to um, the gym once ever and think that your body's going to be great and no, amazing. No. And this mindset piece really is the same. You need to invest in the relationship with self and, yeah, that self-talk. So we had a massive, 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 amazing four days. And, um, yeah, I mean, Tony Robbins might not be for you, might not be your flavor. Totally respect that. But definitely encourage everybody to find um, a way that they can integrate new ideas, new concepts, um, and really actively work on that mindset piece forever. Yeah, whether it's just reading a new book or something or opening your mind to something else. Yeah, going yeah. to seminar- seminars or events or workshops or training days or improving skills. But, yeah, I feel like, you know, we talk about this so much on the show that our relationship with ourself sets the tone for every other relationship that you have. So yeah. what is it that you're doing to improve that relationship with yourself and get to know yourself and what you really want, what you really desire? So for me, I just find it amazing and um, so worthwhile of the investment of time, money, energy, all the things, because it's not easy to take yourself out of life, normal life for for four days, days for on end. 14 hours a day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but um, every time it's so worth it. So. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's my fuel up. That's definitely mine as well. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't have much to add on top of that. So let's introduce this week's guest. Today we've got Debbie Rivers joining us. She's a relationship expert who works with singles and couples. Debbie's been doing this for over a decade and is consumed with empowering and people to be successful in love. She is obsessed with having bigger conversations about love, dating and relationships. Debbie's motto is that it's never too late to have the life or love you have imagined. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. No worries. So can you just tell us a little bit about your story? Like why did you deep dive into relationships? You know, I think I've always been obsessed with relationships. But, you know, as a kid, I didn't have high ambitions, right? <laughs> I mean, 
imagine getting married, living happily ever after with, you know, having a great family. And my parents didn't have an especially great marriage, but I thought that I knew better and I could create better than what they did. And I got married. I met my, you know, Prince Charming, whatever. And we were married for 21 years, but I was desperately unhappy at times. And I felt like I'd failed at the one thing that I wanted. I really thought, (laughs) it's really dumb. I, I met my husband at 18. I was married at 20. I thought that I was wise. I thought that I knew how to create a relationship. And the reality was I didn't. And when people say that divorce is easy, to be honest, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. You know, like like cutting off half of my body and surviving. So my passion really is helping people make the right choice the first time around or when you're in a relationship, knowing the grass isn't greener on the other side. Mm. It's either freaking fake or they haven't watered it enough. So I honestly wish that I have known what I know now then Mm. and I might have been in a different position. You know, so many factors. I think we do copy what our parents did and, you know, my parents had an unhealthy relationship and no one teaches you how to do a relationship. Mm. So was it out of your own divorce and your own experience that you got invested in becoming a relationship expert? Absolutely. I kind of sometimes think I accidentally fell into it. But when I was married, I remember that we did take marriage classes and we even took a group of people through a marriage book at one stage. But yeah, look, what happened is I accidentally fell into, I consider myself a bit of an accidental entrepreneur, right? (laughs) At businesses, I'm like, never freaking doing that. It's the worst thing ever. But I thought that it would be fun to start speed dating. You know, my passions, I could talk, I could have glasses, meet new people. But I really discovered it was one thing to introduce people. Another thing for them to get it right. And even in my own journey, you know, I left my marriage 15 years ago and getting that right, like I still thought I was wise and choosing the same thing again and expecting a different result is an insanity. Mm. And, you know, at one stage I found myself dating a guy and I'm like, even my kids go, he reminds us of dad. And I'm like, I didn't leave a marriage to be in exactly the same position. Mm. So I wanted to work out how you could avoid doing that. Like what does it take or... Do you know, there was some research on Relationship Groundhog Day that people leave a relationship thinking that they're going to choose better, but they all end up choosing the same thing, which is crazy. Mm. But you have two choices. You either learn how to take yourself with the right skills into a new relationship and get it right with the type of person because we bring our shit with us, Right. Or you learn to choose someone that works for you if that personality type or those values don't work. Mm. So, you know, I kind of went down, why doesn't it work the second time around? How can I help people? And how can I help people the first time around save that world of pain, right? And one of the interesting things too, I think the divorce rates for second marriages are actually higher than the divorce rates for first marriages. So Yeah, it is an interesting stat or topic to kind of dig into. And it sounds like you've done a bit of digging in that area. Well, I think it's about 67%. And look, for one reason, it's once you've walked away once, you know you can do it again. Mm. Yeah. You literally take your same patterns and do the same shit and expect a different result, which is insanity. But I probably know firsthand the grass isn't greener on the other side. I find with couples, right, the stuff you argue with that breaks up your marriage is the stuff that you argued about at the beginning. By the time we went to counselling, it was so far gone that you couldn't resolve it. Whereas if you did this stuff at the beginning, it changes everything. And look, that's what I'm passionate about. I, I suppose maybe it's wanting to take your pain and use it for good. Yeah. So Debbie, you mentioned that if you knew then what you know now that you maybe wouldn't have ended up choosing divorce. So take us back there. What were the things that went wrong? Look, I think that like in the beginning days of your relationship, like chemistry makes everything so easy. You know, Mm -hmm. you do everything automatic. It's no drama. And then you, look, I didn't live with my husband until I married him. So we went out for two and a half years we moved in together. That was a shock to find out how incompatible we were on some levels, right? Which I'm going to talk about that a bit more. 69% of conflict in relationships is unsolvable. That's a lot. (laughs) But, you know, I married, I thought I married an extrovert, whereas I really married an introvert. I was painfully shy. 
And I grew up, so I got married at 20. I probably grew up through my 30s. Mm. And I became really outgoing, loved the world. He hated the world and liked to live in a country town and not talk to people. Mm. But we were quite opposites in, in some things. But knowing some of the stuff I know now, you can even navigate that. So something you touched on there was that you are opposites, but and I know you've done uh, dived a little bit deeper into opposites attracting. So, do opposites really attract in relationships? Absolutely. You know, I think I think we look for in the other person what we don't have in us. So mm-hmm. you know, I remember when I met my ex husband, he was really outgoing, really funny, really you know, like I'm like I wish I could be like that. So you're almost drawn to what you love in them that you don't mm-hmm. have. And then it pisses you off. <laughs> <laughs> they're not like you and they don't yeah. think like you, right? But the fact is remembering why you were attracted to them in the first place. And I think there's some things that make you incompatible. And if you really knew that to start with, you'd also save yourself a world of pain. Like people, mm. people think that we need to fall into love like it's some freaking accident. Mm. <laughs> and that's what a lot of people do. They don't look and go... Does the person value what I do? Do they have, you know, the same long-term dreams and plans that I do? And look, in my case, I divorced and we had some of those long-term goals and dreams in place, but Mm. we changed over time. So even being able to navigate how you change is essential. And I probably don't see my marriage as a failure because it was 21 years. Mm. But I would have liked to have gone to my 40th and 50th wedding anniversary, (laughs) been on the TV. You know, we all dream of that sort of stuff. And I do believe it's possible. So you kind of mentioned that opposites do attract, especially in the beginning of a relationship. So do you think that opposites then can have long-term thriving relationships? Absolutely. And I think that, you know, so when I said before that 69% of conflict in relationships Mm. is opposite, it's because we marry someone with the personality the opposite of us. Mm. So you really can't change someone's personality. So it's unresolvable because you like them for who they were and now you want to change them. And Mm. without really realising, if you kind of celebrate the differences and if you get to that conflict, say, It's the introvert that's annoyed that the extrovert wants to go out every night of the week. (laughs) You know, you're going to have to have some really honest talks about how you can work that out. And Mm. know that trying to change them and argue is one of those unresolvable things. So instead of wasting weeks, months and years on that, you just kind of accept it. Yeah. Yeah, I really like that. One of the things I want to come back to is you you talked about um, falling into love versus um, I'm trying to be much more conscious about using the the language like stepping into love. And that I do, I do think that we have we have emotions and we have feelings, but I also think we have choice and I think we have agency. And if you've met someone who doesn't have values alignment and doesn't want the same things that you do or wants the same things but not on the same timeline, like don't eat the cookies stay out of the kitchen. Exactly. I like that. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's so true. But, you know, I work with a lot of people, especially even the second time around, they so value chemistry Mm. and they want something they've never had. And the reality is, you know, they're looking for this instant attraction that only 11% of the people feel. And Mm. if you do feel it, it's usually toxic. It's usually Mm. your patterns from your past or, you know, that you're repeating that feels comfortable and familiar Mm. but not going to be good down the track. So I'm with you, consciously create love. And those feelings grow and they become stronger with the person who's got your back that's, you know, I don't know, people value how someone looks but I prefer emotional intelligence, self-awareness and kindness Mm. down the track because you forget how someone looks. You look at them every day. <laughs> <laughs> and they can become really ugly when they're not kind to you and when you're feeling lonely in a relationship. So the high importance people put on the wrong things is often what gets people into trouble in the first place. Mm. So if that large number, uh, that, that large percentage of conflict is unresolvable, what does agreeing to disagree look like? Well, I think... You know, like say with some issues that are in a relationship, it depends on what issues they are. Like Mm. really knowing the story behind why someone else can't compromise. So when you get to that gridlock, you know, like Mm. the the conflict that you can't solve, 
right? Usually, say, for example, you want your kids to go to a Catholic school and your partner doesn't agree with the whole Catholic system. Mm. Maybe you need to know the story behind why that's important to you. So Mm. you get some understanding of usually it's something to do with your values, your dreams that you can't compromise on. So I recommend in that conflict, do a circle. On the inside of the circle, put what you can't compromise on. What in that situation just you can't move on. It's Mm. your values. It's what you believe in. On the outside, put what you can. You know, like say... I'd be okay with going to church three times a year and, you know, without doing this. Whatever that is for you, probably I should use an example that's not religious, but people can feel strongly about certain things. Maybe it could be one person values going out for dinner every Friday. They feel like it's this family occasion that they could do and the other person feels like a home-cooked meal is the way to celebrate the end of the week. And maybe growing up, one, their family celebrated one way and the other did it the other way. So it's not what they're doing, it's what it means behind what they're doing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think understanding why something is important. And I often, I know that Nathan and I, when we've had those kind of conflicts where either of us has had an emotional response where you've gone, no, no, this is really important to me actually stopping and considering, well, why? Why do I feel that way? What is it for me? Like, And often I know in my experience is when I've stopped to prop and examine it, sometimes I've actually be, become more open to making a different choice as I've examined the why because the why, it turns out, is probably not actually all that compelling or <laughs> maybe the why was, well, that's what my family did or that's what, that's how, and then examining, well, did that work for them? If that didn't work for them, why do I want to do it that way? Exactly. Look, I think another difficult one can be money, right? So maybe Mm. one of you wants to pay the mortgage off as quickly as possible and the other is spontaneous and lives in the moment. Those, uh, you're in such opposition in how you want to live that, that, you know, maybe there has to be compromises in, we'll pay $20 off the mortgage extra a week, but we'll also put $20 in an account to go on holiday. Mm. And having the discussion of how you can both address your competing goals because money's a huge one and it's something that if you're on the same page but if you're on the opposite page, you know, people tell you to mirror someone's conversation back to them Mm. and hear their words. But I remember doing that at the end of my marriage. We, We had to do one where we took a small problem and it was around money and we had to... You know, we both were in really jobs where we were paid over a hundred grand. We owed twenty thousand on our mortgage, and his problem was he needed that mortgage done there and then, and mm. it was stress. In my mind, I couldn't understand the stress behind that because it didn't make sense to me. Mm. So, just mirroring back what someone says doesn't help you really understand each other's positions, does it? Mm. And and like you say, really going the reasons why and how you can compromise around that mm. if relationships are compromised. Yeah, I should give an example on that and maybe ours is a religious one as well. But um, I grew up in a yeah Lutheran family. Nate grew up in a Lutheran family. We actually both went to the same high school and had very similar education paths. And part of being in that uh, high school sort of age is that you go through something called confirmation and you learn more about the Bible and then you are kind of just making a decision that, yes, these are my beliefs and you get up in the church and you you say that. You, you kind of go through a ceremony or a ritual to do that. And at that stage of my life, when I was like maybe 15, I went, yeah, no, I don't think so. This is not for me. I don't believe that. I have a lot of questions. My worldview is a little bit different. Whereas Nate did go through that process. And then when it came time for us to get married, there was like, well, are we going to do this with a civil celebrant or are we going to do this with a pastor or a priest or someone from the church? And that was a huge uh, thing that we had to kind of work through because for me, it felt like a really big compromise that I was going to have a really important moment in, in my life centered around some beliefs that I just don't believe. But when I looked at it from Nate's point of view, it was 10 out of 10 important. So I, it was 
if I want to marry this person, this is really important mm-hmm. to them. Yes, I also feel strongly about it, but is it a deal, no deal? And if we were both at deal, no deal, we wouldn't be here today. <laughs> no, we wouldn't. So well done for navigating that so well. Oh, and we were babies too. Yeah, we, were, we were. We got married at, I think 20, it was 23. Yeah, 23 yeah. and 24, I think. Tw- yeah. Back in 2012. Yeah. So Nathan and I are, do have quite a few differences and we're on that uh, extrovert, introvert flip as well. Although maybe um, I'm changing you. <laughs> yeah, although lockdown might be making me slightly more introverted. Um, how can we leverage those opposites for a better relationship? I think, number one, don't try and change each other because you can't. Mm. The, the fact of the matter is you chose each other as you were and you liked each other. Trying to change someone never works. Mm. But maybe appreciating what's in them. And I don't know, coming to some sort of compromise, like, I like the idea of planning each person takes a turn each week to plan a date that the other person can't say no to at Mm. all. (laughs) You're in. You're in and you go without complaining. So, you know, for the extrovert, they can take the introvert out and they just don't complain and they go with it and they explore the world. So being able to compromise but still appreciating how much time you need to be at home, how much time you need to be together Mm. and it, kind of accepting that it is what it is. And it, it's, and we do change as people when we're not, I don't know, the older you get, you do change in the introvert, extrovert. It, it can shift, but essentially you're probably always going to need some time. With real people <laughs> <laughs> and different people. <laughs> so I think you've got to celebrate the differences and not sweat the small stuff, and that can be tough. But mm. if you can kind of... I don't know if you can kind of put it up there on your fridge even that these are un- unresolvable differences and know what they are. You stop trying to change each other. And I think so. we do a very similar thing around our dates as well is that we, we like alternate organising dates for each other. And it is really nice actually when someone organises a date and to see them thriving in their own, like in where in the environment that they really thrive in. And, and if they're excited by something too, like it is really great, even if it's not something that, that I would ordinarily do. It's really great to see like the semi really excited by something. And yeah, like you said, that is kind of the person that we fell in love with in the first place. And it's really good to kind of actually see that, that side again and to, yeah, really enjoy who we fell in love with. Absolutely. And I think that when you go and not complain, because that's the key. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Knows this. Why do I have to do that? That's unpleasant. Cut out that sort of stuff because it's not helpful for any relationship. So we know that if we're going to have a lot of this unresolvable conflict, it doesn't mean it's not going to occur, right? It's just maybe that it's not resolvable. What are some of the ways that we can do that conflict well? Okay, so I've done the Gottman training and they talk about the four horsemen. So what I find is like the stuff that you break up with is always in your relationship. So knowing how to deal with it. And the Gottmans did study people. And, with, you know, 92% of accuracy, they could tell which relationships would work and which didn't. Mm. And it came down to not communicating four types of ways mm. and also having a soft startup. So it's not what you say, it's how you say it. You know, a lot of people fall into them. And what they found is the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which are criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling and contempt, can be found in any relationship. Mm. But it's how you apply them. So like if you come in kind rather than harsh on someone, you know, Mm. you're an idiot, you never get anything right, is is criticism where you go, oh, that didn't feel good when that Mm. happened. Could you help me put out the garbage? So you're not criticising the person but the behaviour. You know that I would always recommend using I language and talk about your feelings and not blame the other person which takes practice. Mm. But when it comes to the horseman, right, with, so criticism goes without saying. Mm. A lot of people are brought up in critical homes, so being critical is second nature. So maybe being aware, you can have a complaint without being critical. So if you change how you bring something to someone as a complaint, yeah, I was really disappointed you didn't remember to pick up the milk 
instead of you're an idiot for not picking up the milk, you always do that shit and I'm sick of it. Mm. There's two different ways to how that feels and it's yeah. really quite simple. So, you know, the solution to criticism is to make a decision not to and maybe catch mm. yourself in the moment of doing it and learn to you can't not bring up what's wrong and that's often the problem. Like there's this whole elephant in the room where you never take out the garbage and it becomes not about the garbage but not being there. Yeah. 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 We had, um, I don't know, I think this one might be contempt as opposed to criticism, but we, along, it was all a few years ago now, we had an issue with our fridge, right? And the issue with the fridge was that the hygiene standards and the quality of food that was being kept in our fridge probably wouldn't pass a food health safety <laughs> inspection to the point where uh, there were, we had a, a plastic con- click container that had some vegetables in there that were definitely not going to be eaten. And I was t- very tired and very frustrated of being the only person who was dealing with vegetables that were no longer were worth fresh food people. Fresh. <laughs> and I left it there. I took a silent war that I was not going to deal with this and it got very bad that the cucumber then was then no longer cucumber shaped. It was liquid cucumber <laughs> shaped. But this was like, it was no longer about the freaking cucumber. <laughs> it was a, about me feeling like I, that was something that I had, was my totally 100% my responsibility and I didn't feel like it should be like that. But I also hadn't communicated that. And it turned into a much bigger thing and a huge piece of resentment that was both, I think, loaded with criticism, loaded with contempt, with no communication until it escalated to a point that it absolutely didn't need to get to. (laughs) Which happens all the time. And Nathan, you probably didn't even know the vegetable situation. Yeah, that I was was in a silent war. I was, yeah, yeah. Do you know, they they do find that one of the biggest ways to solve conflict is, you know, around cleaning and household issues. So get a cleaner solves about 50% of people's relationship Mm -hmm. issues. Yeah. Outsource what no one likes. Yeah, what you don't like and aren't good at, if there's that overlap where you both don't like it, you're both not good at it, do your best to outsource it. (laughs) Absolutely. And look, I sometimes think, you know, one of the things I did really well in my marriage that we never had conflict on is we early degree, early agreed what we would do. So mm. he liked to shop and cook and I didn't enjoy either of those things. Mm. So I always cleaned the house. I always did the washing and I never got resentful mm. at all. And, and when we had kids, yeah, I did it all because I was home. So, but we had clear, this is what you do. This is what I do. You could ask each other for help, but there wasn't the resentment around it. So Mm -hmm. sometimes men don't speak hint for one. Mm. It's not a language that they're fluent in. No. We um and it's interesting that you say this because we've the conqueror, the resolution to this was that I will own the fridge and health hygiene of cleanliness of the fridge, produce in the fridge, fridge is my domain. Whereas I will not do sinks and benches. benches. Don't do it. It's not my domain. (laughs) And does it work? Yeah. Yeah. So I think doing some of that stuff, and and I think being clear, no one teaches us to ask for what we want and what we need, and it sounds very cliche, but women, we talk in hint. We Mm. we say stuff that we go, you know, he should have known what he meant. And, you know, I have this problem when I'm coaching people and even talking to girlfriends. As girlfriends, we go, oh, we can't believe he did that. Or didn't do it. (laughs) Talk to guys and they go, well, no, we were giving them space. We're being respectful for that. So we're still talking different languages yeah. a lot of the time. And because we're not clear about it, the guy has no idea. And, and then yeah. the resentment grows, right? And then those four horsemen come in. So that whole defensiveness, I love that one. I'm really guilty of that, especially around my kids. They'll tell me I've done something wrong and I'll defend myself because I'm like, mm. no, I did that because of that. Mm. Well, when you defend yourself, you're actually not hearing what someone's telling you. You're pushing the blame back on them and not hearing a word they say. Mm. But I think that one's hard to deal with because when someone (laughs) tells you you're wrong, our automatic response is to defend ourselves, right? Mm. Rather than hear what they say. And I think getting into the practice of going, you know, okay, taking the criticism and then bringing up the other issues later when it's not emotionally charged. 
Mm. Yeah. And I think on the flip side of that too, for the person delivering the feedback or who's got the, the problem, I guess, that they're trying to bring up, um, it's also important that you don't use the words always or never. It's something that we've, that we've yeah. definitely adopted because as soon as you say always or never, the other person can then pick out that one time that they have done it and use that as a defense against what you're saying. So, so I think it is important to not use those words while you're trying to communicate your criticism. Absolutely. And, you know, it's like when the person will give, people will go, well, give me an example of when I did that. That's that I find that's also hard. But mm. yeah. you talk about things when they come up rather than leave them to become the elephant in the room. And I think when, you, when you're in a relationship where you can both take responsibility, it's easier and you're emotionally aware. You know when people say relationships shouldn't be work? I still say bullshit. As much as it should be, you've got two different people living with each other. Mm. There's always going to be some level of having to navigate that. And maybe in your early days, it's the worst. Do you know what I mean? Because you, you mm. have to kind of work out how that's going to work down the mm. track it doesn't become a problem because, you know, like even though I remember years of it, you just work smoothly, then certain things won't be a problem if you deal with them in the beginning. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we talked a little bit about criticism and defensiveness. Can you give us some examples of contempt? I think I gave you one, but I'm not sure. <laughs> well, contempt is it's not just like the person's beneath you. It's the worst of them all. And they actually reckon when you have contempt, it's a sign that your marriage is heading to the end. Because mm. when you just think that the other person is a piece of shit, that's contempt. Like mm. you just don't value anything about them. So it goes way beyond criticism, which you said with the fridge. Mm. It built up and it had built, yeah. built up until it exploded. Have you seen the exploding watermelon on TikTok? No, <laughs> no but I'm going to go look for it. <laughs> and put rubber bands around the middle of this watermelon. Oh, I have seen yes. it, Yeah. <laughs> and they fall off their chair. But that's kind of what those tensions become like that leads to an explosion of contempt. Yeah, watermelon can handle one rubber band, two rubber band, three rubber band, four rubber band, but how many does it take before it actually explodes <laughs> everywhere without releasing any of that pressure? Yeah, and it's like the Coke bottle that you shake up. You like shake it up enough, it's going to explode everywhere. Mm-hmm. And, and that's where you get to in contempt rather than dealing with stuff as it comes up. Yeah. Stonewalling is my favourite. <laughs> <laughs> if you can have a favourite of <laughs> no nose for conflict. Favourite horseman, yeah. Probably the one I hate the most. Hate is a strong word. Yeah. But men are more guilty of stonewalling and they're more guilty of stonewalling because their nervous systems aren't as involved to deal with the emotional conflict as ours are, which is interesting. So they literally get emotionally flooded and they can't cope. And I think it's if their heart rate gets over 100, they're flooded, they literally cannot hear what you say. So Mm. when a guy shuts down, you literally have to give them 20 minutes to walk away. But in my marriage, I used to follow. I used to be the person that would follow and go, but I just need to say this, causing much more conflict because I don't know, from my perspective, someone shutting down to me was the worst possible thing. Mm. But understanding that people get to the point that they can't take it makes it easier to go, okay, let's come back to this. Mm. Am I right in saying that stonewalling is things like, yeah, of course, you're right, you're always right, like, and just shutting the conversation down by, like, disengagement almost? That and sometimes they just go quiet. They just stop talking to you and walk away. And Mm. I do have a tendency of doing that at the best of times, but they reckon women are much more likely to stonewall. So there's kind of a difference, like there can be bids for attention where I'm trying to get your attention and you might kind of shrug me off. But the stonewalling can be that literally you're in the midst of the argument and they just shut down. Mm. They don't say anything more. They withdraw from you. Or even the person that's in a relationship and you've got some conflict and they have to go away for a couple of days Mm. rather than deal with it. I mean, that's stonewalling at its worst. It's kind of emotionally withdrawing. And if you do that often enough, that's also really destructive. Yeah. yeah. So it could be the opposite. It could be that you're, you've are you noticed that your partner is not themselves and you're actively not asking what it is. You're choosing to overlook your partner's discomfort or emotion or whatever they're, they're demonstrating. Yeah. So what are the best antidotes then for each of the horsemen? Well, I suppose the criticism is is the, the simple one, kind of 
make some agreements to cut mm. the criticism and change your communication. And a lot of people, I don't know, I know a lot of, you know, I come out from an English background, sarcasm is king, right? Like mm. the humour is sarcasm. Well, I'm just being sarcastic. But mm. words, words can hurt. And in a relationship, some of the, I mean, I remember things being spoken to me and like they stick for mm, forever. Forever. Yeah, and I just sometimes think, don't say them. Just, just mm. don't. I mean, you can probably think of times in your relationship that those words that they said hurt more than freaking sticks and stones, right? So I, I kind of think, don't say some of the stuff you say. When it comes to contempt, again, the, deal with it sooner. Don't let the resentment build. Start to mm. speak clearly. Start to kind of have some agreements in place around that conflict defensiveness there's none of that you always <laughs> you mm. never you always do this generalizations always talk about always talk about how you feel and I think for women a really good trick to do is I felt upset when you did that it didn't feel good what do you think mm. most guys want to solve your problem so you've you've just mm. kind of put him into problem solving he doesn't like hurting your feelings he wants to then fix it and sometimes we want to have our say. I'm going to blah, blah, blah. Mm. Too many words. You don't need it. That felt terrible for me. I didn't like how that felt. It didn't feel good. Or when you forgot to put out the garbage, I felt like I didn't matter. Mm. What do you think? I don't know. As a guy, Nathan, how would you respond to that? I guess I would feel upset and I would want to solve the problem. Yeah. yeah. So you kind of change the dynamics by changing your communication. Mm. And yeah. We really got into the feelings behind it. Because often that's what's bothering us. We feel unheard. We feel unseen. And when this stuff gets out of hand, it's because you're not being heard. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, this has um, been amazing. And we talked about that you went through a divorce like 15 or odd years ago. But I'd love to know, what's your relationship status now? What are you doing now? Well, I'm actually, I'm actually with someone. But what I find really interesting is how, you know, people think that they've got to go... I don't know, work on their stuff before they get into a relationship. And you can spend years working on your stuff and get <laughs> yeah. advice on your stuff. It, it can be like I can sometimes be like the hairdresser that doesn't do my own hair or the plumber that doesn't do my own plumbing. Some of the stuff comes out in another relationship. And I think the best way to work on yourself is in a relationship. Do you know whether that's mm. dating or whether that's with someone? Because you can think you've dealt with this. And it's really interesting, I've found in the relationship I'm in, how some of this stuff comes up. And I, I can get really angry with him about something that's got nothing to do with him. You know, like it's it's my stuff from the past. And it's kind of got to go, no, I've got to put those rose-colored glasses on in this relationship and not penalize him for what I didn't like with my last partner. So yeah, mm. I like um, my last partner wasn't very social, so he'd sometimes go sit and wait for me in the car. <laughs> and when this guy hasn't been social, I was like, oh, my God, I can't do this. We probably need to break up. An overreaction to is there another way I can deal with this? You know, can I mm. talk to him? How that, that emotional reasoning behind it. But, you know, mm. I, I kind of used to think maybe it was the choice in partners, but no matter who you're with, What's interesting for me is the same stuff comes up. Yeah, you're the constant. Yeah, absolutely. You're the common denominator in anything. So working on those things in your relationship is the best thing you can do. And even if you leave, they're going to come up again. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like it's not necessarily about having done all of your work prior to the relationship, but having the self-awareness throughout a relationship to be able to see some of those patterns reflect on yourself and really acknowledge some of those things that do keep coming up. Yeah, because I would have thought that I was sorted. I was done. I <laughs> we always do, right? We think that we're self-aware. We think we're emotionally intelligent. Yeah. But that's just recognising the stuff. It doesn't mean you don't get angry. It doesn't mean that you don't get upset. It's how can I deal with this better? Yeah, it's kind of just that continual building of the toolkit you've got you can add more and more tools to build a bigger and better house it's hard to build a really great house if you've only got a hammer absolutely you probably just bash it around but do you know the average couple only spends 10 minutes talking per day and it's usually about their to-do list so being mm. able to kiss each other you know they reckon the couples that survive kiss each other goodbye every day they're warm they're affectionate they hug 
They mm-hmm. go on those weekly dates and maybe they have the, the weekly state of the relationship chat too. All of those things that you're not taking it for granted. You're mm-hmm. making the yeah. most of what it does. And even things around sex, right? I reckon that women that are able to talk about sex have better sex lives. So having some of those conversations is invaluable. And I think you asked about books to recommend. Have you guys read this one? Oh yeah, the eight dates. We had um we had a couple who came on the show and they that book changed their whole relationship. They were thought they were at the end. They thought that maybe we should just really great housemates, really good friends, but they'd lost the sparky bit. At, yeah, the eight dates book just absolutely pushed them or shoved them into the next chapter of their relationship. Yeah, and it's really beautiful. Yeah. And I always think you can get the spark back. Mm. You know what I mean? Like if you've loved mm. someone to start with, it can always come back. And, and I think as someone that's divorced, that feels bad for me that, mm. that I, I couldn't do that. But I do believe that if both of you are willing to work on it, you can yeah. increase, increase that spark. And, you know, going back to what you did in the beginning, I often think that couples would work if they just did what the other person wanted for two two weeks. If they both did what the other person wanted, which is what you did when you first met. Yeah. yeah. Go where they want to go, eat what they want to eat. Do the task that they ask you to. Yeah. <laughs> but we get it, get trapped in this. Well, if they love me, they would. If they really knew me, they would do this. And I think that if you went back to in those first days, you'd do anything because it just felt so good. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Debbie, this has been such an amazing chat. Thank you so much for sharing the time with us and your own personal story, but then also your your expertise. But to say thank you for joining us, we've given um, a year's worth of seeds to a family in Malawi so that they can continue to nourish themselves and their families and the community that they live in for years to come. So thank you so much for making that possible. Thank you for having me. I could talk about this stuff all day, really. (laughs) Yeah, it's great. So Debbie, if people want to connect with you or learn a little bit more about what you do, how should they do that? Okay, so my website is simple. It's debbierivers.com.au. I am on Instagram. I'm not very good on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's dare to, the number two date, Debbie. It's because, I, I, like I said, I started off with the whole speed dating. So I've got two websites. My passion is the coaching and relationships, but I still have fun running events and introducing people as well. And if couples want to come and have a bit of a chat, how can they do that? Oh, via your website or do they need to see you in person? Via the website. So um, there's contact details on there. They can ring, they can email. Perfect. Thank you so much, Debbie. Thanks heaps for joining us. If you love what we're doing here and want more, subscribe to the Date Forever podcast to make sure you never miss an app. Come and hang out with us and other awesome couples who are fueling up their relationships in the Thriving Couples Collective Facebook group or check us out at purecollective.com.au. Until next time, keep on dating because better relationships equal a better world.